First of all, let me acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal people past and present. I'm John Minns and I'm the director of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies, ANCLIS, here at the ANU. And it's a great pleasure today to be able to host this forum on the Pacific Alliance, which I'd suggest is a significant development for Latin America, for the world economy and also for Australia. Why for Latin America? Because in the first place together these four countries represent more than a third, perhaps as much as 40% of Latin America's GDP. They also represent, I think, a significant process of integration that's, been take, that's taken place across the region. Already the Mercado Integrado Latinoamericanum, the MILA, has integrated the stock markets of three of these countries, Colombia, Chile and Peru, with Mexico, I think, due to join that process sometime next year. Why significant for the world? Because together, again, they represent something like the, large, the ninth largest uh, economy in the world and economies with a, a very prominent export orientation uh, and outward, outwardly directed economies to the rest of the world. And why significant for Australia? Because the alliance represents an increased orientation, of course, to the Asia-Pacific, a significant tilt in that direction, a region, of course, with which Australia's fortunes are inextricably linked. The, today we have four ambassadors, the four ambassadors from each of the countries within the alliance who will speak uh, for about 10 minutes each. And we are very pleased to have as well Mr Kelvin Thompson, the Parliamentary Secretary for Trade, representing the Australian Government to speak first. And he was also the Australian Government's representative for the Kali Summit of the Pacific Alliance, which has been held recently. But before I introduce those speakers, let me, by way of welcome to the ANU, introduce Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at the ANU. She is responsible for enhancing the university's national and global leadership in the provision of research-led education. She is... Uh, a major important academic, of course, published six books, former Rhodes Scholar, former winner of the Prime Minister's Award for Australian University Teacher of the Year, and uh, an important person in the university in directing our global efforts at, uh, at uh, international outreach. And today, as Acting Vice-Chancellor, still, she's representing the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Ian Young. Good morning and welcome to ANU. It's a real pleasure for me to provide the formal welcome to uh, this uh, incredibly important event and to the university. For those of you who might, like me, be students of history, uh, the significance of this forum is really, truly, uh, I think, evident. If you look at the pattern of world history, you'll see that, of course, the entry of Latin America into the global system of economic and social and cultural exchange really provides a pivotal moment in the story of globalisation. For good or ill, Latin America has been, I think, the driving and engine of much of what the world is today. And so it's no surprise, of course, that we see our colleagues, our excellencies, come to join us to take, I think, the next step, which is to make sure that that integration in all its positive ways continues and that the learnings from all of our experiences in global integration transfer into our local region, the region of the Asia-Pacific. I'm delighted that our excellencies from Peru, Chile, Colombia and Mexico are here with us this morning. And Kelvin Thompson, thank you so much for giving up your time to share with us your insights. And this is an appropriate place to host such an event. Not only does ANU have exchange agreements with all of the partners in the Pacific Alliance, we have collaborative research projects in Latin America and these research projects cover biology, political economy, anthropology, forest science, indigenous policy and, indigenous re and international relations. But there's also something important for us to note which comes out of my portfolio, which is we are the only Australian university that offers a bachelor degree of Latin American studies in addition to a major in Latin American studies. And we have a number of postgraduate students studying Latin America. 
there's a sense in which this is a space in which we all need to be watching, paying attention, learning not only from the, from the past, but discerning how important this region will be for our future. The existence of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies, much, much easier to say, UNCLUS, John, much, much easier to say, has an intensive program of research, teaching and outreach to promote interest in and the understanding of Latin American politics, culture, economy and society. We also would like to uh, note that, of course, this is a good place to host this forum, not only because of our strength in Latin American studies, but also because of our strength in Asia-Pacific studies, with, of course, uh, many events planned for Asia-Pacific week, but this is a great way to kickstart what is truly the right way to approach discussions around the region, which is with an international flavour. So let me uh, congratulate the organisers of the uh, Alliance and this meeting. And I will hand now back to John. So thank you all for, for joining us. Thanks very much, Barney. I'd now like to introduce uh, Mr. Kelvin Thompson, the Parliamentary Secretary for Trade. Uh, Mr. Thompson is, uh, has represented the seat of Wills in Victoria since 1996. And he was, as I said before, the Prime Minister's representative for the recent Cali meeting of the Pacific Alliance. So he's ideally placed to provide an Australian perspective on the Pacific Alliance. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank him for coming today because it is a parliamentary sitting day in a very important week, of course, the last sitting week before the election. And uh, Parliament begins at 10 a.m. So he's on a tight schedule and we'll have to leave pretty much after this. But thanks again for arriving, uh, for coming to this forum. And I'll now introduce Kelvin Thompson. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak and also the opportunity to leave. Uh, as you will be aware, this is the, uh, uh, the last sitting week of the, the parliament. It's said that a week is a long time in politics and this might be one of those weeks for which that expression was designed. Uh, and, and in a hung parliament, uh, uh, the penalties with an opposition perpetually threatening a no confidence motion, the, pe uh, the penalties for lateness uh, can be quite severe. Um, I want to acknowledge the uh, Acting Vice-Chancellor of the ANU, Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington, uh, Dr John Minns, the Director of the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies, uh, His Excellency Mr Pedro Villagra, the Argentine Ambassador and Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, and other members of the, uh, the Diplomatic Corps. Uh, the, the Ambassador of Colombia was uh, uh, kind enough to uh, uh, work out that I was interested in Australian birds and before I went to Colombia she gave me a, a, a Colombian bird book. Uh, the opening sentence of this book says that uh, Colombia is famous not only for its coffee, beautiful women and the friendliness of its people but also for its birds. So having met the ambassador and been to Colombia I'm in a position to confirm the accuracy of that sentence. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Arvin Subramanian of the uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics wrote earlier this year that uh, multilateral trade as we've known it will progressively become history. I think the important phrase in this sentence is, as we have known it. Indeed, this current period for international trade will probably go down in history as an extremely difficult time for the WTO system but it will probably be equally seen as a period of renaissance for multilateral trade, a period where creativity and cooperation between like-minded countries has led to some extremely innovative ways to break down barriers to trade and further trade liberalisation. At the forefront of this innovation stands the Pacific Alliance. Its four members, Mexico, Chile, Colombia and Peru, are some of the most economically dynamic and liberal countries in Latin America and make up a third of the region's output. Together, they represent the eighth largest economy in the world. It's a free trade agreement described recently by The Economist as exciting, inspiring and intriguing. And you only need to look at some of the outcomes from last month's summit to get a sense of why the Pacific Alliance has been described in this way. Members agreed to eliminate 90% of all tariffs on merchandise trade once the agreement enters into force with total abolition of all tariffs being the ultimate goal. The handling of the remaining 10% is due to be resolved by the end of this month. Members also agreed to eliminate all visas between member countries for business travel and tourism. A further seven countries became observers, 
including Ecuador, France, Honduras and Portugal. And I'm sure that the ambassadors will speak to you in more detail about these and other achievements. Uh, while it will be important for it to consolidate its work to date, the Australian Government is impressed by all that has been achieved by the Alliance since it was formally established a year ago. It was a privilege for me to be the Australian Government's representative at the Pacific Alliance Summit last month in Cali. It was the first summit open to observers and Australia was honoured to have been admitted as an observer to the Alliance, which we value highly as a manifestation of increasing economic and political links between Australia and the countries of the Pacific Alliance. The government and people of Colombia did a fine job of hosting the event. The summit came against a background of Latin American trade with Asia growing strongly, and we believe that Australia has a unique ability to provide a practical and commercially significant link, a connecting rod, between Latin America and the dynamic economies of Asia. And we see this summit as an opportunity uh, to restate our desire to strengthen our ties with Latin America. Our trade with the Pacific Alliance countries ranks amongst the highest of our merchandise trade partners, $4.9 billion in 2011-12. And trade in services uh, is also important. You've got mining, you've got the related services, you've got education. Uh, I appreciated the opportunity to meet with a number of our colleagues in the margins of the summit of the meeting. Uh, I had the opportunity to congratulate Chile for its outstanding pro tempore stewardship of the Pacific Alliance during its presidency and I congratulated members of the Pacific Alliance on their impressive results to date on liberalising the movement of goods, services, capital and people and the speedy and nimble nature of the actions taken. The Pacific Alliance could be very important for Australia. Its formation comes at a time when the Australian Government is stepping up its engagement with Latin American countries follows a path forged by a growing number of Australian companies already doing business across the continent. And members focus on getting rid of barriers to trade and boosting productivity and promoting the flow of trade and capital across a common market aligns with Australia's own trade priorities. We believe that Australia has much to offer countries of the Pacific Alliance in mining, education, water and renewable energy. The Australia-Chile Free Trade Agreement which is a high quality agreement, provides a strong link to the Pacific Alliance. As a consequence of the agreement, we've seen trade grow by 27.5% annually since the agreement entered into force in 2009. We share a similar geography and similar experiences. There is already a great deal of trade and interaction between our countries, but we think there can be more. We have growing links in education, there are more than a thousand Chileans currently studying in Australia and the government has identified cross-border education as the highest priority for Australia for APEC uh, in the coming year. In my meeting with the Chilean Mining Council, we discussed the way in which the Austrade experience could be relevant for Chile in a variety of mining issues uh, as we have similar problems. I also think that there are great opportunities in water technology, and in energy, which is a key issue for the future of Chile. Australia is in a position of privilege by having substantial energy reserves like natural gas. We've also done a lot in terms of renewable energy. We've established a goal of 20% renewable energy by 2020, and while doing that, we've developed the renewable technology such as solar and wind power. The areas of the Chilean economy which are potentially attractive for Australian investors are mining and related industries, technology, equipment and skills, water, renewable energy and uh, also financial services. At the same time, Australia is seeking to attract investment in infrastructure, transport, renewable energy, agriculture, information technology and communications. Like the members of the Pacific Alliance, Australia believes in the ability of trade to improve living standards and foster a robust economy. We have a, proving, a proven track record, having been at the cutting edge of trade liberalisation as it has progressed over several decades. One in five jobs in Australia is believed to be linked directly to trade, and we've experienced 22 years of uninterrupted annual growth. 30 years ago, Australia signed our Closer Economic Relations Trade Agreement with New Zealand. 
The agreement is recognised by the WTO as one of the world's most comprehensive, effective and multilateral compatible free trade agreements. Since 1989, most services across the Tasman have been traded free of restrictions. Since 1990, all goods meeting the agreement's rules of origin criteria have been traded free of duty and quantitative import restrictions. And two-way trade between Australia and New Zealand has grown by over 7% each year over the agreement's lifetime. More recently, the ASEAN Australia New Zealand free trade area that came into force in 2010 has been one of Australia's most ambitious trade deals to date. It's our largest FTA, covering goods, services, intellectual property, e-commerce, temporary movement of business people, competition and economic cooperation. It spans 12 economies and represents a market of over 640 million people with a combined GDP of $4 trillion. It will eliminate 90% of tariffs on Australia's current exports to some of our key trading partners by 2020, providing enormous opportunities for Australian businesses. Today, Australia, like members of the Pacific Alliance, is party to some of the most innovative trade deals currently being negotiated. Along with Mexico, Chile, Peru and seven other nations, we are negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreements. The current TPP members account for nearly 40% of global GDP and almost 800 million people. It will be more than a traditional trade agreement. It will address behind the border impediments to trade. It will also be a living agreement, allowing flexibility to deal with emerging issues and for expanding membership. And it has the potential to become a building block for economic integration in the Asia Pacific. Another ambitious trade deal working towards a free trade agreement for the Asia Pacific is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, that agreement was launched last year. The 16 negotiating parties, including Australia, account for almost half the world's population, almost 30 per cent of the world's GDP and a quarter of all exports. This ASEAN-driven agreement complements the TPP negotiations. It provides competitive tension and will strengthen the ambition held by all involved to deliver outcomes that will lead to an open and integrated region. Most importantly, both these agreements are pathways towards achieving APEX goal of a free trade area for the Asia Pacific. Free trade area for the Asia Pacific region would bring enormous benefits for individual countries, for the region and for the world. Uh, back in 2005, around 45% of the world's output growth was from Asia. By 2025, this is forecast to rise to 60%, accounting for almost half of the world's entire economic output. And in 2025, four of the region's economies, China, India, Japan and Indonesia, are expected to be in the world's 10 largest. Last October, Prime Minister Gillard released the White Paper on Australia in the Asian Century. We positioned, commissioned the White Paper to best position Australians to benefit from and contribute to Asia's rise. That paper outlines a big vision for Australia, an Australia that's even more integrated with Asia. Now, the White Paper process has crystallised our resolve to become even more interconnected. And some of the things we committed to in the White Paper include building Asia capabilities among our young people, strengthening access for Australian investment in Asian markets and increasing the number of Australian businesses working across cross-border value chains which have sprung up across the region. Now, how is this related to the Pacific Alliance? Well, as the government outlined in the White Paper, Australia can act as a connecting rod between Latin America and Asia. In particular, Australia has much to share with members of the Pacific Alliance as they pursue their core objective of linking more closely with the Asia-Pacific. The healthy growth in trade between Australia and Latin America in recent years has demonstrated the growing ties between us. Two-way trade between Australia and Latin America has grown from around a billion dollars in 1990 to almost eight billion dollars last year. Taken together, the Pacific Alliance countries account for around five billion of the eight billion. But these figures don't just tell the t story of the benefits that come from liberalising trade, they tell a broader story about increasing ties between our people and the benefits of plugging into cross-border value chains. It's in these areas where there are many examples of Australia serving as a link uh, with Asia for Latin America. 
More than 250 Australian companies are now working in Latin America. Many Australian mining companies extract minerals and metals there and then export them to customers in Asia through new and existing supply chains. Likewise, Brazilian, Chilean and Mexican firms are investing in Australia in beef, coal, manufactured food, auto parts and beauty products which are supplied to Asian customers. Finally, Australian schools and universities have become a hub for interaction between young Americans and Asians. Last year, 32,000 student enrolments in Australia were from Latin America, joining nearly 400,000 enrolments from Asia. These examples show just how Australia can serve as a link between Latin America and Asia. They provide real examples of what we envisage a more integrated Asia-Pacific region to actually look like, where goods and services are able to be traded seamlessly across borders and where we're able to build on our strengths by working together. We're very pleased and privileged to be an observer of the Pacific Alliance. We feel that observer status gives us opportunities to be involved which are relevant for us without perhaps distracting the Alliance by asking it to focus on questions of membership. We have much to offer members. We share similar geography and similar experiences. We also have a lot to share in terms of our knowledge and experience of working closely with Asia for several decades. As I note, the Prime Minister is pointing out vigorously this morning, Australia's economy stands as a beacon of resilience in the world. Unlike virtually every developed economy, during the global financial crisis we avoided recession and saved hundreds of thousands of jobs in the face of the worst global conditions since the Great Depression. We now have low inflation, low interest rates, AAA credit rating, low unemployment and low public sector debt. We have low government sector outlays as a percentage of GDP and a low tax take compared to other advanced economies. Our, um, the, the OECD estimates of total tax revenue as a percentage of GDP show Australia at under 26 per cent, well under the OECD average of over 33 per cent. Among advanced member economies, only the United States and South Korea have lower tax takes. We've been able to cut taxes, reform business taxation and assist small businesses with increased tax deductions. In conclusion, we are excited about the future for the Australia-Latin America relationship as we trade more, as we share more and as we build solid and long-lasting relationships. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Mr Thompson, for uh, being here and for that speech. Uh, I believe there's a car waiting uh, downstairs for you, so thanks again. I'd now like to introduce the Ambassador of Colombia, Her Excellency Clemencia Ferrero Ucross. Her Excellency has been Ambassador of, uh, from the Republic of Colombia to Australia since February this year. Amongst many other things, she was the Colombian delegate to the Andean community, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador of Colombia to Canada, to Sweden, and non-resident ambassador to Norway, Denmark, Finland, and Iceland. She's also been the permanent representative to the United Nations Office in Geneva and the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. Please welcome Her Excellency Clemencia Ferrero Ucross. His Excellency Pedro Villagla, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps and of the Latin American and Caribbean Group. Distinguished colleagues of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. <coughs> Richard Neumann from DFAT, graduates from DFAT, Professor Manny Hughes Warrington, Acting Vice Chancellor of ANU, Dr. John Mintz, Director of ANCLAS, Dr. Eugenia De Muro, Mr. Tim McLennan, Vice Chairman of Alabac and member of COALA, dear friends and dear colleagues. It is an honor indeed for us, the ambassadors of Chile, Mexico, Peru and Colombia, to be able to share with you today information and to bring to this prestigious academic scenario our approaches to the relevant process of integration that our countries are currently consolidating. We wish to express our profound gratitude 
to professors John Mintz and Eugenia de Muro for organizing this forum and to DFAT and COALAR for their most valuable support. It has been a great privilege to have the participation today of Parliamentary Secretary Kelvin Thompson, who represented Australia at the recent Cali Summit. We are extremely pleased that Australia, a prominent actor in the Asia-Pacific region, together with New Zealand and Japan, have approached, approached our process. This innovative mechanism of the Pacific Alliance started on October 2010, when the president of Peru, Alan Garcia, presented an initiative to the presidents of Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, and Chile to build an area of profound integration, as he called it, with the aim of ensuring the circulation and flow of goods, services, capitals, and persons. In December 2010, the president of Chile, Sebastián Piñera, convoked the presidents of Peru, Colombia, and Mexico to discuss how to strengthen the relationship between their countries and how to define the road map of the works leading to that goal. In April 2011, at the first summit of the alliance held in Lima, the ministers of trade and foreign affairs were instructed to elaborate a framework agreement on the basis of the already existing free trade agreements between our countries. The process of drafting and negotiating the agreement culminated successfully very recently in Paraná, Chile, on the 6th of June of 2012, with the signature of the agreement that is now in the process of being ratified in each of the countries. In a very short period of time, the Pacific Alliance, due to the commitment and inspiration of its leaders, can now show itself to the world as a consolidated group of like-minded countries with a total population of over 209 million inhabitants, 36% of the Latin American and Caribbean total, with a gross domestic product per capita of US dollars 10,011. The GDP of the Pacific Alliance member countries accounts for 35% of the total Latin American and Caribbean countries' GDP. In 2012, the Alliance member states' growth rate of 5% of was higher than the global average in the world of 3.2%. I would like to elaborate briefly on the key objectives of the Alliance, which go beyond, as President Piñera from Chile pointed out in Paraná, beyond traditional free, free trade agreements, and I quote, as it aims to project its members into the Asia-Pacific as a joint force. Let us start by the definition of the Pacific Alliance as an area of regional integration in a context of open regionalism. Article 2 of the Framework Agreement states as essential requirements for participation, the rule of law within the respective constitutional frameworks democracy, separation of powers, protection, promotion, promotion, and guarantee of human rights and fundamental freedoms. The, objective of, uh, of the objectives of the Alliance are as following. A, construction of an area of profound integration in a participatory and consensual manner to advance progressively towards the free movement of goods, services, capitals, and people. B, growth, development, and competitiveness of the economies obtained through the integration process are intended to contribute effectively to the improvement of the living conditions and welfare of the population of our countries in a context of social inclusion and of gradual elimination of social imbalances. C, 
the Pacific Alliance intends to become a platform for political articulation, economic and trade integration, and global outreach, particularly towards the Asia Pacific. As President Santos has pointed out, the process is open to other countries which are already interested or might be interested in the future, and also seeking to promote trade and investment, not only among ourselves, but also to the Asia Pacific region. The actions to achieve the above mentioned objectives are A, liberalize commercial exchange, exchange in goods and services with a view to consolidate a free trade zone. B, progress towards the free circulation of capital and the promotion of investment. C, develop actions to facilitate trade and customs matters. D, promote cooperation between migration and consular authorities and facilitation of the movement of persons. E, consolidate the prevention and containment of transnational organized crime. F, contribute to the integration of the parties through the development of cooperation mechanisms uh, through the Pacific Cooperation Platform, which was signed in December 2011. On the occasion of the Cali Summit, which took place on the last days of May, Costa Rica and Panama were welcomed as observer candidates. Canada, Spain, Guatemala, Uruguay, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan were present as observers, and we also welcome France, Ecuador, El Salvador, Honduras, Paraguay, Portugal, and the Dominican Republic as new observer states of this integration process. Today, my colleagues and I will summarize the results obtained and the advances made in each of the working groups that have been established in the framework of our ongoing negotiating process. I will proceed to make reference to the Group on Services and Capitals, led by Colombia. It is important to note that services represent 71% of the global GDP. The participation of services in, of, of, in the GDP of the countries of the Pacific Alliance is of 60% in Chile, 61% in Colombia, 62% in Mexico, and 50% in Peru during 2010. The participation of services in employment in the Pacific Alliance is of 70% in Chile, 61% in Colombia, 62% in Mexico, and 65% in Peru during 2010. The four countries of the Pacific Alliance represented 41% of the foreign direct investment during 2012 in Latin America. 41% of foreign direct investment in the Pacific Alliance is related to natural resources. 21% corresponds to the manufacturing sector and 38% to the services sector. Taking into account the importance of services and investment in the world, this group is negotiating in relevant disciplines. Investment, financial services, professional services, telecommunications, maritime transportation, air transportation services, and electronic commerce. A committee on services and investment has been set up that will allow also the direct participation of the private sector. We are also working in the field of tourism and have already signed an agreement of cooperation in this topic in order to advance in the formulation of joint projects and initiatives to increase the flow of tourists from and to our countries. As was mentioned by Professor John Mintz, the stock exchange of Santiago, Bogota, and Lima are already integrated, and Mexico is in the process of undertaking the legislative measures that are necessary so that by 2014, the Mexican Stock Exchange can also access the Latin American integrated market, MILA. I will end my remarks 
by stating that Colombia, who has now the honor of chairing the alliance for a one-year term, attaches great priority to this process. We consider that it is an open process and a flexible process that has clear goals of a pragmatic nature, we are, which are coherent with our model of development and of our foreign policy agenda. For Colombia, the Alliance of the Pacific is a fundamental pillar of our inter internationalization strategy, particularly towards the Asia Pacific. We have been participating in several working groups of APEC and are willing to join the TPP negotiation. Our economy meets uh, the conditions already to do so, and we are very glad to have received very committed expressions of support from the Prime Minister of New Zealand during his recent visit to Colombia, and also positive mentions by the United States of America. We have a sound and growing economy, a stable macroeconomic policy, and we have received the investment grade by the most important risk factor agencies uh, in the world. With the entry into force of the, of the framework agreement, we will be able to define a strategy of projection to the Asia Pacific together. And at the same time, to deepen, as we are already doing, our strategic association with our partners. The private sector has been incorporated to the integration process through the setting up of a business council that met for the first time during the Cali Summit. We certainly think and appreciate that we are going in the right direction and are obtaining relevant results. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Your, Your Excellency. Uh, my apologies. It seems that the interest in the Pacific Alliance has exceeded the capacity of our room to sit everyone, so my apologies to those who are standing at the back. I'd now like to introduce the Ambassador of Chile, His Excellency Pedro Pablo Diaz. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Diaz was appointed to represent the Republic of Chile in Australia in June 2010. He's had a very long business career, uh, including 30 years with Coca-Cola, finishing, I think, as Vice President for Latin America of Coca-Cola, and has served on the Board of Directors of quite a number of Chilean companies as well. He's also taught at some of the most prestigious universities in Chile. Please welcome His Excellency Pedro Pablo Diaz. Yes, it's true. I was appointed on June of 2010, and more than that, I present my credentials on June the 24th of 2010. Three years ago, exactly, more or less, at this time, so it's my anniversary as an ambassador. Um, three years ago. Pedro, Senor Decano, Richard Neumann from DFAT, Tim McLennan from Coalair, our good friend John Mintz, colega de America Latina, colegas de la Alianza del Pacífico, embajadores que nos acompañan, muy especialmente usted, embajador de la República de El Salvador, que tengo entendido su primera actividad pública es esta, nos honra su presencia aquí, y welcome to Australia. So I am very happy today, even this day, but we are very happy in this anniversary to be here in the Australian National University, and thank you to the university for this opportunity, to discuss and exchange views on what is being spoken about at this moment, and intensely by our Latin American neighbors. As affirmed by the President of Chile, Sebastián Piñera, at the Lowy Institute during his state visit to Australia last year, 
We are four Latin American countries twin together, but free to choose our own way. The path in which to achieve development and finally defeat poverty and improve the quality of life of our citizens, we have chosen this pathway and at the same time respect our neighbors who have chosen another. <coughs> this alliance is not closed and it's not a closed structure. On the contrary, it is an alliance that comes with open arms because it's awaiting the incorporation of new members who can join this effort, which is an initiative and a goal that our parents and grandparents have always sought but never achieved. It's true, Latin America has always had everything. It's a, content, a continent generous in natural resources, populated with harmonious, hardworking and honest people with enormous potential because of its geographical location with coastlines to the Atlantic and into the Pacific. However, after 200 years of independence, we're still an undeveloped continent with unacceptable levels of poverty. <laughs> the reality is that one thing is to have the opportunity and another is transforming that opportunity <clears throat> into a reality. One thing is to have a dream and another is to have a project. A dream is something that has no dates, no time frames, that has no content except for those that one can dream. A project has a specific dates and a plan of action to achieve. I feel that Latin America, and particularly the four countries of the Pacific Alliance, have made a crucial decision to transform this dream into a reality. The Pacific Alliance represents a third of the population of Latin America, but more than 50% of our region. It is a young alliance, not yet three years old, but the, despite its youth, it has been fruitful. We cannot forget that it, that is what our people desires. We want results. The fruitfulness of this alliance has occurred for many reasons. Firstly, because I feel the four founding countries have a common vision, a common vision of the world in which we were chosen to live in. As a result, we have a common vision in the way we would like to overcome poverty and undevelopment. The path is based on freedom, an ample freedom, a freedom with no exclusions, freedom in the political field, field freedom in the economic field, and freedom in the social field. That's why the commitment the four countries have with democracy is the best expression of political freedom. We also have the commitment to social market economy, free, open, competitive, transparent, as the best expression of economic freedom, but also leading to the defeat of poverty and greater equality of opportunities as the best expression of our social freedom. I feel it's these principles that have guided us during these three years that the Alliance of the Pacific has existed. This 
must continue to guide us, particularly at times when doubt, pessimism, and divisions come into our souls. For these reasons, reasons, it's natural that countries with common values and principles, and who also share the coastal shores of the Pacific Ocean, should make the effort to transform this opportunity, which I mentioned before, into a reality. And we're achieving it. It's not a coincidence that the countries that make up the Pacific Alliance are the fastest growing of our continent. Nor is a coincidence that these are also the countries that have attracted the largest foreign investment. This is due to a division that I believe, this is due to a vision that I believe is the correct vision that together the four countries are steering towards with a great decision and at the same time with great pragmatism. For example, today the Colombians, Mexicans, Peruvians, and Chileans can move freely around the four countries without visas as a way to reflect that this is not only an agreement to freely move goods <coughs> and services. This is an agreement for people to also move freely, which is its ultimate goal. It also seeks to integrate investment and capital markets and physically unite our entire region. We are a profound alliance that is looking to go beyond what had been the traditional efforts of integration in Latin America. Finally, although they intended well, they were not well oriented and have not yielded the fruits the citizens of Latin America expected for, of them. Nowadays, we have more of our young people studying through scholarships in other countries that we have integrated into the Pacific Alliance. This exchange allows us to get to know each other better and facilitates integration. Today we have a business council that in just a year of existence has made a solid and ambitious proposition. For instance, nowadays we have achieved a deeper integration in the business world and in the society. In this respect, our export promotion agencies are working together. We already have em embassies where we operate jointly, the four countries. This allows us to significantly expand our presence in all continents of the world, especially in the most dynamic markets. Today we have mutual collaboration in several areas, as never before. As a result, we have a commercial agreement that has not, been, that has not only been ratified by Mexico and Colombia, but also unanimously by the Chilean Congress. With this agreement, 90% of the goods and services are free to circulate without any type of tax. Our goal in the near future is to reach 100% in order to fully, tra fully transform this into a true integration. The Alliance has many observers countries, such as Australia, Canada, Costa Rica, Spain, Guatemala, New Zealand, Panama, Uruguay, and recently incorporated new countries in the same condition. This is the case of Portugal, France, Ecuador, Paraguay, El Salvador, and the Dominican Republic. There are very important things to bear in mind. We cannot sit still. It's true that we have achieved a lot in less than three years. But the most significant things to do are yet to come. We have spent 
too much time postponing the true aspirations of our people. For them to have a higher level of opportunity, welfare, and to overcome poverty. That has been present in our region for far too long. During the summit of the Pacific Alliance that was held last year at Paranal, Antofagasta, in the middle of the desert, situate, situated at 2,800 meters about sea level in Chile, we met at the world capital for astronomical observatories. From there, we, we gazed at the world and what is the universe. And that was not coincidence, because the Pacific Alliance is oriented to look at the stars, to look beyond them, and to set ambitious goals for the future. That is the hope, the commitment, and the willingness that we com commonly share at the Pacific Alliance. I'm certain that the best of the Pacific Alliance is yet to come, and that we will build it, build it together. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. At the conclusion of the presentations by the ambassadors, there'll be a period for questions uh, and discussion. Uh, but now let me introduce the ambassador of Mexico, Her Excellency Beatriz Lopez Gagayo. Ambassador Lopez Gagayo has been Mexico's ambassador to Australia since 2010. Before that, she was Consul General in Arizona and Deputy Head of Mission in the Hellenic Republic. In the Secretariat of Foreign Affairs in Mexico City, she's been, she has served as Director in the Latin America and Caribbean Division, Deputy Director for the Organization of American States, and Head of the Japan and Republic of Korea Section. Please welcome the Ambassador of Mexico. Thank you. Good morning. His Excellency Pedro Villagra, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps and also Dean of our Latin American group, who has a lot of joy every time that we meet. He's always joking, as you know him. We have uh, great uh, meetings always with him. Well, Excellencies, Professor John Means, Director of Australian National Center for Latin American Studies, distinguished guests from DFAT, I think also from Austria, um, from uh, the Education Department. Thank you to all of you for being here today with us, and all uh, ladies and gentlemen as well. Uh, today, it has been said the Pacific Alliance is a mechanism for the economic and commercial integration of our countries, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and Peru. It was formally established just a year ago. June 6, 2012. The similarities in economic policy of the member countries are a perfect base to boost the initiatives in the alliance in terms of environment, innovation, science and technology, and social development. The linchpin of President Peña Nieto's administration, Mexico, I quote, as an actor of global responsibility is reflected in the Pacific Alliance Agreement. The country's membership in the Pacific Alliance represents the possibility to consolidate its presence in the region, and particularly in South America. President Peña Nieto has expressed that with the Pacific Alliance, and I quote, we foresee a great opportunity of growth and economic development for the four member <coughs> countries and eventual and future projection to what we have planned from its origins, that it's mainly a greater integration to the Asia-Pacific region. Seen from the other side of the coin, the deep integration sought to the Pacific Alliance makes our region much more attractive to the very dynamic Asia-Pacific region. Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and Peru represent a market of almost two trillion US dollars and a population 
of approximately 208 million people. The Pacific Alliance is the 10th economy in the world, and our total trade is 1,047.5 US billion, 48% of Latin America total trade. But why the Asia Pacific region? Well, the gross national product of the 24, 21 most important economies of the zone is equivalent to 50% of the world production, and taken all together, they represent 46% of global trade. I will talk to you about the movement of persons working group coordinated by Mexico. Well, this group is based in Lima Declaration of 28 of April 2011, which establishes the progressively advance of the free movement of products, services, capital, and people as a general purpose of the Pacific Alliance. The group aims to promote the cooperation among migratory and consular <coughs> authorities of the member countries. The movement of persons is considered a tool to reach a deep integration, growth, and competitiveness on this scheme. Some of the areas that can benefit from these are tourism, academy, and business. The first accomplished stage in this free flow of tourist and business persons has been already a result. In November 2012, Mexico announced the elimination of the visa requirement for Colombian and Peruvian nationals to undertake non-remunerated activities for up to 180 days. Peru confirmed also the elimination of the visa requirement for business people of member countries. These actions have already eliminated all migration barriers among the member countries for purposes of tourism and business. A second proposed stage foresees a work plan on four areas. First one would be facilitation on the flow of migration at points of entry to Pacific Alliance member countries. This will be done through a study of the Inter-American Development Bank to expedite people entries. The second would be follow-up to the information exchange mechanism on immigration alerts. There's a subgroup on security that is meeting with the purpose of identifying measures to optimize communication among the offices involved. The third commitment would be the analysis <coughs> on the possibility of adopting a memorandum of understanding on holiday work programs. This is directed to young students to take vacations in the territory of the Alliance member countries for a specific period <coughs> with the option of training and the possibility to work. And the fourth one would be the evaluation of consular and migration <coughs> cooperation procedures using the four consul Consul countries consular network. It is also important to mention uh, as a commitment of this group that in the declaration of Cali, it was announced that its members will evaluate the conditions under which a Pacific <coughs> Alliance visa for third party, party countries would be issued. has been the spillover after all these measures have been taken? Well, after migration barriers were eliminated and the Pacific Alliance Tourism Cooperation Agreement was signed in August 2012, there was an increase on the number of tourists among all member countries. Colombian and Peruvian tourists to Mexico increased up to 63.4% in the first four months after the visa requirement was eliminated. Also, during the first two months of 2013, Peru became the fifth place on country sending tourists to Colombia, Chile the sixth with 35% more than in 2011, and Mexico the ninth with 17% more than the previous year. And another result has been that in the last summit, 
the Chambers of Commerce of the Pacific Alliance countries and Spain began talks to create a union. A union to ease the movement of people and merchandise and get the benefits of the integration between the member countries. This is about networking and exploiting the commercial advantages that come out. As you know, today Mexico is the 14th largest economy in the world and from 2020 is expected to become one of the top 10 economies. Mexico has 12 trade agreements and it has privileged access with 44 countries, 1 billion people. Mexico is the ideal export platform for G reaching two thirds of the world's GDP. Mexico ranks in the top 20 of Harvard's Atlas of Economic Complexity Report, which recognizes that our country manufactures and exports a large number of sophisticated goods. The country received US 19.4 billion in foreign direct investment in 2012. Mexico's favorable image as an attractive investment destination can be seen in various international reports and documents, including the third of the American chambers, the impact of safety in Mexico in the private sector, shows that 92% of the companies interviewed emphasize their commitment to continue investment, investing in Mexico. In the last year, Mexico improved its position in three of the five main international competitive indices, Institute for Management Development, Doing Business, on the Index of Mexican Institute for Competitive State on the same position, and on the first edition of the Economy Complexity Index of Harvard and MIT. Mexico ranked of the 20th place between 120 economies. Mexico is also part of APEC and is in the TPP negotiations. Now, let me tell, tell you, why is Australia important in the Pacific Alliance? Well, for Mexico, Australia has been a long proponent of the value of trade liberalization as a driver for sustained commercial and social development, enhancing economic and people-to-people -people links. <coughs> this way of thinking is intrinsically linked to the economic policy of President Peña Nieto's administration and the core values of the alliance itself. Australia represents a practical and commercially significant link between Latin America and the economies of Asia. Australia provides a good base for expansion into Asia and vice versa, the Pacific Alliance is a very important <coughs> economic forum that opens the economic gate of Latin America to Australia. As you know, Australia trade with the Pacific Alliance countries has been 4.9 billion in 2011, 2012. Trading services, as parliamentary secretary said, is also important, including mining, its related services, and education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me now introduce the Ambassador of Peru, His Excellency Luis Quesada. Before Ambassador Quesada's appointment in 2011 as Ambassador of Peru to Australia, he was the APEC Senior Official for Peru. Within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he's been Director for Human Rights, Director of Asian Affairs, Japan Desk Officer and Chile Desk Officer. His overseas postings include having been Deputy Chief of Mission in Japan, the United States and Sweden, at the APEC Secretariat in Singapore and at Peruvian embassies in Japan and Chile. Please welcome His Excellency Luis Casado. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Your Excellencies, ANU authorities, distinguished guests. I wish to um, thank ANCLAS, the Australian National Center for Latin American Studies who in association with uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and uh, COALAR, Australian Government's Council on Australian Latin American Relations, have made possible this forum on Pacific Alliance. I also wish to thank the distinguished speakers who have preceded me. 
and acknowledge the insights from Professor Marie Huge, uh, Marie Huge Warrington, ANU Active Vice Chancellor and Deputy Vice Chancellor, Parliamentary Secretary Mr. Kevin Thompson, the PM's representative at the Pacific Alliance Summit in Cali, as well as my colleagues of Chile, Colombia, and Mexico that have left me little room to speak after all their comments. But um, they have said, they have talked us um, about um, uh, what the Pacific Alliance means in terms of population, in terms of, um, of um, the GMP, uh, for instance. But I would like to start my remarks with trade. The Pacific Alliance members account for half of the region's total exports. This contrasts starkly with intra-regional intra trade in Latin America that as a whole makes up just 27% of total trade in South and Central America, compared with 63% in the European Union and 52% in Asia. The private sectors in the member countries have played a big role in setting the alliance's priorities. The stock exchanges of Chile, Colombia, and Peru have created a single regional board, which once Mexico joins, will be the biggest of Latin America. Negotiators are working to smooth border procedures and, standard, as, and standardize rules, such as on labeling. They are making progress in talks to harmonize the rules of origin, how much local content goods must have to be tariff free, in their existing trade agreements with each other. The member countries of the Pacific Alliance are the third major source of foreign direct investment in Peru, following the European Union and the North American bloc, US and Canada. This is according to data from the Chamber of Commerce of Lima. The main sectors in which they invest are finance, mining, industry, and trade. Now, my, my colleagues have also spoken about uh, the, the observer countries. I think we should mention also that the United States is interested in joining the Pacific Alliance as observer. And we members would like to see the US sign up sooner rather than later as part of a broader goal of creating a free trade area of all countries in the Americas with the Pacific Coast. The United States currently has free trade agreements with almost every country on the alliance. As it has been mentioned, the Pacific Alliance was established in Lima on the 28th of <coughs> April, 2011. Just one year since it, its establishment, the Pacific Alliance has become, for all intents and purposes, a free trade area bringing together the four most open and market-oriented economies in Latin America, which account for more than half the region's trade, mostly commodities in high demand in China and other parts of Asia. The alliance has also become the most dynamic integration bloc in Latin America, and thanks to the focus on liberalization and private sector-driven outward engagement, are also registering the highest growth rates in Latin America. The alliance may be pointing the way to a new model for Latin American integration, growth and development. In addition, it is poised to become a strategic platform for the admission of its members into other far-reaching multilateral agreements, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership currently under negotiation. One way the new group plans to combine efforts is by setting up joint trade promotion offices in Asia. That may not sound like much, but it will enable the group to make a more competitive pitch for Asia. Each country can focus on what they can do best and find ways to support each other's top products. The main opportunity for the Pacific Alliance will come later on as it pursues its more ambitious objective of boosting commercial ties with Asia. The countries could look to strike a free trade agreement with regional groups like the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. In the Alliance, Peru is leading the group of institutional framework. As we all know, the regional integration initiative that our countries are jointly undertaking requires a proper legal and institutional framework. And that first critical step has been achieved through the adoption of the framework agreement of Pacific Partnership on the 6th of June at Paranal, Chile. The Peruvian Congress last Thursday ratified with 85 votes in favor, two against and three abstentions, Peru's signing of the framework agreement of the Pacific Alliance. Mexico has already ratified the framework agreement. The Chilean Congress has already approved it and will soon proceed to its ratification. And the Congress of Colombia has approved it, having been sent by the executive to the Colombian Constitutional Court to complete internal procedures and processes of approval regarding its entry into force. After Paranal, the technical group, Institutional Affairs, 
under the leadership of Heru, has continued working hard, having developed various institutional documents of legal nature, such as the guidelines on guest observers states of the Alliance, already having been approved by the Council of Ministers, the guidelines for accession to the Alliance, which have already been approved by the Halliwell Group, the guidelines for the operation of the Council of Ministers of the Pacific Alliance, which is still pending, and the guidelines for the coordination between the High Legal Group and the Council of and Committees of the Pacific Alliance also awaiting approval. Since the negotiation of these documents is still ongoing, they are yet uh, under some sort of embargo. However, I can tell you that the technical group on institutional matters has been working on the cross-cutting themes of the additional protocol to the Pacific Alliance Framework Agreement, such as the preamble, general provisions, protocol management, and final provisions. All of this pursuant to the mandate of the high level, level group on the so-called critical path, referring to the requirements for entry into force of the instruments and the implementation of agreed commitments under the Pacific Alliance. Also noteworthy is the progress made regarding the dispute settlement mechanism which applies to the integrity of the agreement and which will constitute a secure, flexible, and transparent mechanism for the resolution of disputes arising between the parties concerning the, the interpretation or application of the agreement. This mechanism provides for an initial stage of formal consultations on the specific issue in dispute. The legal institutionalism which is being built will give sustenance to the decisions taken within the Alliance and will enable the interaction of our countries in the globalized world and with other integration schemes. In summary, all progress and achievements in institutional matters are also a testament to the efforts of our countries towards the establishment of an area of deep integration with a stable and predictable legal basis to generate security for operators which secure to the benefit of our countries, making the Alliance a platform of interest, realities, and projections in the Asia-Pacific. The Asia -Pacific. Now, as for Australia, Australia is interested in positioning itself as a connection broad between Latin America and Asia in pursuit of the APEC goal of arriving at a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. In that line, Australia sought and obtained observer status in the ongoing negotiations involving the four uh, Pacific-facing uh, nations of Latin America. Australia is a valuable partner for Peru. It is a fifth investor in our mining industry. We must highlight that the four nations of the Alliance are like-minded with Australia as open traders. As for Peru, well, I mean, the latest figures show us that we are uh, one of the countries that uh, has its economy booming with a relatively high investment grade. And in the World uh, Bank's Index of East and West Business, we are in the 13th place in protecting investors. So uh, we have um, robust, uh, a robust economy we are perceived as a market-friendly nation, expected to grow around 6% uh, this year. Uh, of course, I mean, this process, this alliance, has challenges ahead. There's no doubt that the Pacific Alliance countries face challenges, not least those associated with the reliance on commodities and some structural reform to better institution, institutional capacity in general. But it's precisely the drive of a very ambitious agenda that moves the alliance forward what will move the respective bureaucracies to keep up with the aims and goals of the, the political leaders. The most essential ingredient, political will. This may prove to be precisely the strong element to surpass those challenges. What is certainly clear is that the four members, now in the vanguard of the regional economy, are positioning themselves to take advantage of the rise of not only China, but also the power of the Asian markets as a whole with a view to increasing trade and identifying new investment opportunities for their own economic development. The four have firm proponent, proponents of market-friendly policies, with each one signing several free trade agreements prior to the Pacific Alliance. Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru have also good compliance records for international commitments in recent years. We firmly believe that the Alliance could build on this promising start and by continuing to apply pragmatic, market-friendly approach, expand and evolve going from strength to strength to make a difference in benefit of the population, <coughs> with particular emphasis on bettering the conditions and opportunities of our societies. Ideologically, free trade does not appeal to everyone, but I can tell you that since the creation of GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, the opening of global markets has meant better standard of living for developed and developing nations. 
There is no country that has prospered by isolating itself from free world trade. Thank you. Let me make a couple of concluding remarks before we go to morning tea and continue the discussion less formally. The first is that from my perspective as an academic who's interested in researching and teaching about Latin America, this is a very exciting time because you know, there was a time when it used to be said about Latin America that it was a region of great potential and always would be a region of great potential. I don't think that's true anymore. Its potential is actually being fulfilled and you can see that over the last decade or two. It's based, I think, that fulfilment of that potential is based on three or four things. The first is democratic consolidation. Uh, several of the ambassadors have mentioned their democracy clause in the Pacific Alliance, but this is now a reality, a reality that wasn't a couple of decades ago. And that's provided, I think, a political stability for the region to emerge and play a much greater role in the world as a whole. The second thing is strong economic growth, particularly since the late 1990s. This has been, overall, of course there have been unevenness in it, but overall, since the late 1990s, the region has emerged as a powerhouse of the world economy. We now run in the Australian National Centre for Latin American Studies, which is a long title, in Anklas. We now run an annual conference whose title is Latin America and the Shifting Sands of Global Power. And that title represents what we think are changes in the world system, which is not just a story about Asia, but a story broader than that, about other regions which are emerging, including Latin America, and playing a more important part economically and in other ways in the world system. Thirdly, I think it's based on greater regional integration. The history of Latin America since colonial times is that individual regions and countries in Latin America tended to have connections with the metropolis with Europe or later the United States, but very little with each other. Economic connections, the infrastructure connecting these countries is very, very limited. What we're seeing now is a process by which they are becoming connected much more, and as a result, a much more powerful force. And finally, I think that not only uh, in Latin America countries having more connections with each other, they're having broader connections with the rest of the world. The connections do not just go to one or two uh, major countries in the world economy, the United States in particular in the last period, but are more diversified. Uh, Latin America has become, to use an ugly word, more multi-directional, and I think the Pacific Alliance represents one aspect of that. So I think, in a, from my point of view, Latin America has become an exciting place to study and to, to develop connections with. In my own area of education, in Australia, the number of vice chancellors who are beating a path through Latin America, visiting educational institutions, uh, connecting with research organisations and funding organisations in Latin America is a very clear example of that. Finally, uh, let me provide some thanks for today's forum. First of all, to our speakers, Mr. Kelvin Thompson and the four ambassadors, their excellencies today for the excellent presentations they've done. Please thank them. Let me also thank the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and particularly Richard uh, Newman, for facilitating this forum, providing support for it, and to all of you for attending. It appears from a glance that we have a substantial section of the future leadership of DFAT here uh, at this forum. And to my colleagues and everyone else who's been here today, thank you very much, and please join us now for morning tea. Thank you.